Welcome to uh, our session at the Aspen Ideas <laughs> Festival called Beyond Fandom, when sports build community. I'm Tom Ferry. I run the sports and society program at the Institute here. We have an incredible panel, uh, panel with us to explore this topic. I'll introduce them in, in just a moment. But a little bit more on the topic. It is uh, American sports make a lot of, lot of money. We know that. And uh, if not for the pandemic, the industry and the sports industry in North America would have generated about $75 billion a year in revenue. It includes ticket sales, television contracts, concessions, and advertising. Less easy to calculate, but also significant, is the impact that sports has on communities. The sports have profound positive impacts on galvanizing civic spirit, coalescing disparate groups, inspiring collegiality, and shining a spotlight on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have leaders uh, from, from teams, leagues, and media companies to talk with us about the power of sports um, and how to make a difference beyond the rink, beyond the court, and beyond the playing field. So uh, first of all, welcome to my left is uh, Sheila Johnson, who um, owns so many pro teams in Washington, D.C., I can't even keep <laughs> count. But she is a founder and CEO of Salamander Hotels and Resorts as well, a collection of luxury properties here in the U.S. and in the Caribbean. She also manages the uh, Aspen Meadows Resort. Uh, as chairman of Monumental Sports and Entertainment, which is the vehicle that <laughs> holds the teams, um, she is the only African-American woman to have ownership in three pro teams. The Woo! NBA Thank you. <laughs> So the NBA's, uh, you know, uh, Washington Wizards, the Washington Capitals, and the NHL, and the WNBA, the champion, WNBA, uh, Washington Mystics. You did win the Stanley Cup. You did win the Stanley Cup? 20, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, I won't forget that, yes, right? you did. <laughs> and you're going to win it next year, right? I mean, we're going to try. <laughs> uh, she is, uh, Sheila is also... Um, sits on multiple boards, uh, arts boards, education boards, including the Metropolitan Opera and the Jackie Robinson Foundation. And she also co-founded uh, a few years ago the Black Entertainment uh, Television Network. Uh, to her left is uh, Javier Gutierrez. He is president, CEO, and alternate governor of the Arizona Coyotes Hockey Club. He co-founded co and is board chairman of Suma Wealth, a fintech company focused on eliminating the Latinx wealth gap. Previously, uh, Javier was, was managing director of the Clear Lake Capital Group, and he also founded and led True Road Capital Partners. Uh, his service includes a board member of the Arizona Community Foundation, which we were just talking about, and the National Association of Investment Companies, and he is also on the advisory board for the Latinos in Society program here at the Institute. Uh, and third, uh, on the end, uh, is, uh, is Ray Warren, who is president of Telemundo Deportes, a division of the NBC Sports Group. He's responsible for the Spanish language production of major sporting events, including the men's and the women's World Cup, the Olympics, the Premier League, the Super Bowl, on and on. Ray has his hands in a lot of different things. So this is a, thank you for joining us. This is gonna be a terrific conversation. I wanna start with a motivation, right? There's a reason people get decide to buy sports teams, uh, and there are many reasons why they buy sports teams. I want to let me into your head when you were thinking about getting into the teams that you've invested in in D.C. Why? Okay, I'm gonna make a very long story short. First of all, um, one one day, uh, Abe Poland came to me and he says, "Look, I I want to make you an offer." He says, "I want you to buy the Washington Mystics," and I said. All of a sudden, I'm like, as a woman, I get this opportunity. So um, he gave me the financials. I realized uh, something was, wasn't working here. <laughs> so uh, I called Ted Leonsis. I knew he had first right of refusal on the Wizards. He owned the Capitals. Called my lawyer. I said, I'll be over there in 15 minutes. And I said, I need you to structure a deal for me. And he says, what is, it, what is it you're talking about? I said, I've been offered a, a basketball team. And he says, Sheila, do not buy a team. <laughs> he says, it just doesn't make money. I said, if you were offered a team, would you do it? And he hesitated, and that was my answer. <laughs> I said, I'm going to do it. And I said, the deal that I want to put together is I'm get Ted on the phone. I'll buy the Washington Mystics. I also want to buy the Wizards and the uh, Washington Capitals. And I wanted to do that because that way 
I wouldn't have to write a check on the mystics. Every mm -hmm. <laughs> but I wanted us to start working as a unit, and I thought it would give the mystics even more financial structure and a stronger business model to do it. Got it. The motivation, woman-owned. Was what? Woman-owned. Woman-owned. <laughs> and what about it? Let me stay with that for a moment. What was it about being woman-owned, having a woman's voice in those boardrooms that mattered to you? Well, I also want to throw the race card in there, too. Black woman mm -hmm. and woman-owned. Mm -hmm. And to be in there, to be able to go to these Board of Governors meetings so that they can start hearing my voice, because you don't hear a female voice in those Board of Governors meetings. Mm -hmm. And it's important that I start opening the doors for other women, and it started to happen. We got now women coaches, we got women owners, mm -hmm. um, you know, WNBA teams. And it's just trying to be an example and a leader for my players that they can see me, because I want them to get off the bench and into the C-suites, mm -hmm. and even get into ownerships. Mm -hmm. Renee Montgomery of the Atlanta team mm -hmm. is now an owner. Okay. That's great. Okay. Javier. So first and foremost, Tom, thank you for having me. Uh, my, my wife and my son are here, so I have to say this. Please invite me back. Aspen is amazing. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, very honored to be here. Um, you know, for me, it's, it's really one word, impact. So I'll set the stage for you. I am sitting in my office overlooking the beach in Santa Monica next to one of my best friends as a partner of one of the largest diverse-owned private equity firms in the world. And I get a phone call from a very dear friend of mine, Alex Morello, the first Latino owner in the National Hockey League. And he says, you need to do this. And I said, what, what, what exactly do I need to do? He says, you need to come to the desert, you need to lead this team, and you need to come and see me, I'll tell you why. So when I went to see him, he says, it's not about sports, it's not about hockey, it's not even about the business of sports. It's about the power of sports to make a difference in people's lives. He says, I want to win a Stanley Cup, but I want to stand for more than just winning. I want us to be beloved as an organization, and really the only way to do that is to do for others. And he says, I think that's where you're at in your life and in your career. And with that, in right before the pandemic hit, I moved my family uh, to Arizona. And it's been that. It's been this incredible opportunity to leverage the power of sports around impact. I'm very honored to be the first Latino to sit in this role as the president and CEO in the National Hockey League. And sadly, the only one in all of professional sports in North America. And so I'm here because I get to bring that voice of the importance of bringing diverse voices to the seat of decision making mm -hmm. and to do so in a way that makes the right you know, impact on communities and it's the right business decision. When I sat my very first Board of Governors meeting for the National Hockey League, the commissioner put me on the spot and said, talk about what your plan is going to be. And I looked around, I said, right now, a third of all of the NHL cities are already minority majority cities right now, okay? So a, a sport light hockey, it needs to, as I often say, borrowing the Wayne Gretzky line, go to where the puck is going. And where is it going in America? Young, female, diverse, <clears throat> tech savvy, and purpose driven. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, someone who understands that is going to eat your lunch. Mm -hmm. And that's what I said in that room, and I think it was powerful that it was, I was able to have that voice to say it. And so it's about impact for me. And the fact that you are Latino yourself and you're delivering that message, how much more effective was that? I mean, you know, if I, uh, I, but, I mean, the fact that it came from someone. Well, I'll tell you actually two things. One, I think it was powerful that it was my voice saying that, without a doubt. I think it showed the authenticity that this is what's important. Mm -hmm. but, but second, I'm also the first private equity executive to run a team. Mm -hmm. Not to own, not necessarily just to own a team, but to run a team. And so when I sat in that room, I was talking about it as much as the right thing to do as the right business decision to make. Mm -hmm. And I went through the actual numbers and opportunity. Right now, Maricopa County, which is where Phoenix is, mm -hmm. is 43% Latina. Mm -hmm. If Latinos don't like hockey, that's a problem for me <laughs> as a business person. Mm -hmm. And that's just pure facts. Mm -hmm. And so when you think of Washington, when you think of LA, when you think of Chicago, when you think of Tampa mm -hmm. and Miami and Vegas, 
Diverse communities need to be part of these sports teams, these sports leagues, because it's the right thing to do and it's the right business decision to make. Yeah. Now, Ray, you know the data, I mean, uh, around Latinos in, 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 in our country, because you're, you're selling advertisers on this stuff. You're making the value proposition. So and audiences. What, 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 what Javier just said there, how important is um, him finding success and that argument really landing for you to be able to do what you want to do? Well, it's, it's all that there is. I mean, if that doesn't work, we're all in trouble. As I said to uh, Javier on the phone, hockey is soccer on ice. So we've got the same game. That's true. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm going to take a step back and say that the... What, so I'm the interesting one here, a little bit fish out of water, right? I'm an Italian-American, born in the Bronx, running the Telemundo sports business at Telemundo, a Spanish language company. And it's been the best six years of my life. I've been in business a lot longer than that, but it was all about passion. Um, and for me, growing up in the Bronx, any Mets fans? My wife is one, she's not here, sorry. Um, <laughs> she couldn't hear me say this. Um, I'm a Yankee fan, I was born in the Bronx in 1954, so you know, like that was a pretty good time. And I knew what the Yankees did for me personally, how I felt when I woke up and I was a Yankee fan and I had my hat and I watched the games and Bill Mazeroski, 10th inning home run to beat the Yankees in the 1960 World Series. So then I came into the regional sports business where passion is what it's all about mm -hmm. in Washington, in Houston, in Atlanta, in LA. It's all about the passion of the fan. Mm -hmm. So I was running the regional sports networks for NBC and saw that with the Celtics game. I said, nobody paints their face green to go to the movies, but they paint it green to go to a Celtics game. Nobody's got, oh, and by the way, let's hear it for Colorado, right? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's passion, right? And so to come to Telemundo and run the World Cup, the whole planet is a regional sports network. Right. Countries are moved, Argentina, Colombia, France, Germany, everywhere, Ghana, you know, Cameroon, the whole world lights up. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's about passion, and it's about taking that passion and using it to help create more access mm -hmm. so that, because one of the things we're trying to do with FIFA is have, you know, Europe and South America and Latin America kind of own soccer. We've got to get more Asian and we've got to get more African teams in, and I'm working with FIFA to try to do that. So to me, it's more of a kind of a national slash global strategy. Right. Um, and, you know, thank God we have folks who can put tents up like the one NBC did to go buy those rights. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we can spread the, spread the love. Right. So, I mean, the original value proposition for sports building community was what you talked about. A team succeeds, the whole community rallies around it, we're fans of the team. But there's been an evolution. Teams have started to think about what kind of Im community impact they can have that is more tangible. Yes. Through their foundations, through their youth, you know, youth, you know, sport programs, through their, I mean, there's lots of things that teams do now that they didn't do even 15, 20 years ago. So let me ask you, what, what are the best way that sports build community beyond winning games and everybody rallying around that? Let me start with you. Okay, um, I'm working on two fronts. Monumental Sports builds playgrounds. We, uh, the women's facility and the Wizards um, practice facility is over in one of the poorest and the toughest wards in Washington, D.C. It's in Ward 8. We decided to build an arena over there to uh, really get jobs for the people over there. We reach out in the community. We work with Martha's Table. Um, there's just so much that we do. Those kids come in and they watch um, our practice sessions. And with the Wizards and the Mystics, they practice together. So that's, that's one way of really touching the community. We do backpack for all that. But something that we just launched, and it have done it, Jason Wright and myself, who's president of the Washington Commanders, almost called them something else, the Redskins, <laughs> <laughs> the Commanders, uh, we headed up a committee, and you talk about reaching out in the community. We're going from Baltimore all the way to Richmond, where we have raised, it's been, um, with all the corporations, $4.75 billion that is going out there, to, and we put those monies into underserved communities, homeless, uh, affordable housing, you, you name it. And that's the way 
we are making even a larger impact. And it all started with the Olympics. Hmm. I was on the committee to bring the Olympics into Washington, D.C., so the blueprint was there. Hmm. When we didn't win the Olympics, we were very depressed, and we said, where else are we going to go from here? So we decided to gather again together and come up with this awesome blueprint of how we were going to raise money from major corporations, and that money will be dispersed over the next five years into areas where we are really touching the communities. So this is a huge impact that sports is making, um, from the commander's team to monumental sports, and we've just really, I, I'm, I'm really excited about this. We, we made the announcement about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So it's all over the wires, and now we're gonna make sure that we're held accountable and then we held these communities accountable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, besides the little communities, you know, the communities that are right there, we're helping, we're there, we're touching, we are making sure the kids are taken care of, we're involved in their education, mm -hmm. But I think that this blueprint of how we're going to really get in there and really change the community because we're very, very concerned about so many issues, the crime issues, homelessness, education, you name it. Mm -hmm. It's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. What about facilities? So, Javier, I want to ask you about this. I mean, what we saw during COVID was sports arenas were used for COVID testing and, and uh, you know, uh, other uses, not just not just hosting games and so forth. You're building an arena or want to build an arena in, uh, you know, where's it? Tempe. 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 And, and you've got other pieces. Talk, talk to me a little bit about that, with how you're positioning the arena as something more than a place to play hockey. Sure. Well, I, I'll first start with what happened during COVID. And what you saw was the power of sports as we convene people, right? We bring people together. And in Arizona, we physically brought people together. Our arena was a voting booth. It was a COVID testing location. Um, it was a uh, blood drive, food drive, clothes drive. It was also a place where we amplified all of these small businesses in our community that were being so impacted. And we encouraged other economic activity to occur that didn't happen just because it was a game. And so physically, you know, sports teams, we are in the community, mm -hmm. right? We impact the community through our physical presence. And you talk about what we're building. We have proposed and actually just recently got approval from the city of Tempe to move towards formal negotiations on a $2.2 billion privately financed sports and entertainment district right a mile and a half from Arizona State University, the largest public university in the country. And the reason that's so impactful, it's a landfill, right? It actually caught on fire six weeks ago. And we're coming in and we're transforming it with the thought that this becomes that gathering place, not just for Tempe, but, but for the entire state, mm -hmm. where people are going to live, they're going to work, they're going to play. I often say it's not an arena. It's a project that has an arena. Mm -hmm. It is an urban redevelopment project and best in class in the country. And so physically, sports teams show up, they redefine the physical, the physical landscape of communities. But, but I will say one other thing. We make a difference because we're present, right? Absolutely. Because we are there. I, I said from early on, when we showed up at the, the Arizona Coyotes, we have had a very checkered pass in Arizona. I think the very first question I got asked and, and have since this announcement are, are the Coyotes leaving Arizona? But what I said is we're going to be there. We're going to extend our hand. We're going to open our doors. And we're going to go out into the community and say, we want to be a part of your life. We want to be a part of what you're doing. And so we've done things that are uncommon, right? We've, we've sponsored a classic car show. Why? Because it's a culture that we want to engage in. I talk a lot about it's important to super serve our fans, but it's equally as important to go after our fans in waiting. And they might be engaged because of our volunteerism, of our philanthropy, because of our content. And that's another thing. Engagement now is more than just what happens during the game. 
It's what happens online. It wa it's what happens with your merchandise. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing, you know, the most popular sports logo in Arizona, sports history. We need to get that out there. We need to engage people where they're at, meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. And that's another part of how sports teams are really making a difference. Now, Ray, you don't have physical infrastructure. You right. do have virtual infrastructure. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we talked about engagement, online engagement, elevating good causes, right. uh, mm, coalescing community around things that are that exactly. are valuable. Talk yes, to me so about- we're, we're the exclusive media partner for the U.S. Soccer Federation's uh, Soccer for Success program. Yep. Foundation. We'll in, foundation, right? Foundation. Did yeah, I yeah, say yeah. Federation again? Yeah. <laughs> uh, foundation. Um, but it's 250 locations around the country that will help underserved, underprivileged kids get on the field um, and, and start to learn soccer um, and what it means to be on a team and what it means to win and lose and share and, and kind of get talked to when you're not exactly playing like a team. Um, half of the members will be of color, 40% will be girls. So that's our way of trying to do it nationally. In fact, it occurs to me, we also have a Black Star initiative that we're just starting talks with, and our WRC station in uh, Washington, D.C. is gonna be the first to help black youth, underserved, underprivileged, have more access to soccer. It's not kind of like a, something you immediately think, but uh, right now, 65% of the U.S. men's soccer team is of color. Mm -hmm. And three Latinos, I believe 13 black mm -hmm. uh, gentlemen. So it's, quite there we have to elevate it amplify it yeah. and and give access to it mm -hmm. yeah. and that's what we're trying to do with the u.s soccer foundation and it's another thing i just want to bring up uh with the caps and um i i was involved in a as an executive director for a documentary about willie o'ree mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the first african-american soccer player who played with with boston mm -hmm. and i got to know uh willie we made this documentary and um so we've really built up a relationship and we've got black hockey teams mm -hmm. over in Northeast, Southeast, and they actually practice in our practice facility. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of really starting to galvanize the community, and this is really important. It's kind of easy for basketball, but to think outside of the box, to really get African-American youngsters on the ice, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's so important that they start seeing diversity in hockey. Yeah. And it's challenging. I want to come back to the youth piece as well. But I want to pick up on something Ray said regarding the, the, the constitution of the U.S. men's national team. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm kind of in love with this team. And why am I in love with this team? Because it is the most diverse team in all of sports. Yeah. It really And they're doing well. I mean, urban, <laughs> rural, they made it. rural, suburban, you know, people who were born here, Americans who were born overseas, they're representing the U.S. Yeah. I think there's a really powerful moment if this team finds success in the upcoming World Cup that can say something about America and how our diversity is actually our strength, yep. right? So Absolutely. talk to me a little bit about the, the role of sport, uh, and that's just one team, but the role of sport in modeling DEI, in showing how this country with all, its, all of its differences, can actually come together and solve problems. Maybe in a physical setting in terms of sports, but maybe there are transferable lessons for corporations or you know, you, yeah. other, other settings. I think it's a matter of access and it's a matter of success. And I think those are the two things that have to happen. I mean, the fact that the US men's team did not make it in 2018 and with this team is gonna be in the World Cup in 22 and hopefully get past the group stage. Um, that's going to show a lot of people how, how things can work. There's a lot, a lot out there that's kind of got to be knocked down and rebuilt. And I don't think you can do that incrementally in some way. So what they've done with the team is, I think, a lesson for countries' teams, lots of people, companies, how just more access and more success. And, you know, it'll happen. You just have to make the move. I mean, I'm starting a Telemundo Sports Academy for women to get behind the camera. Mm -hmm. Most women are in front of the camera. Yeah. We have a really hard time recruiting women to sit in an edit booth for 14 hours and just cut tape. But they've never thought about it. And, and the same goes for people of color. Right. They've never been given access to work at NBC Sports, ABC Sports, wherever. So you have to create a program and I look at the HR folks, like, you got to get me a pipeline. I will hire people. I can't do it 
and run all this other stuff at the same time. But it's, you know, and again, it needs someone, frankly, who says this is what we need to do. Mm -hmm. We need to create access for success. Yeah. And I mean, can I interject? Because yeah, sure. I, I do want to share something because um, I was approached by the same documentarian that did uh, the Willie O'Ree, uh, Kwame Mason. Um, I invited him to be a speaker at our Black History pro program last year. And afterwards, I asked him, I said, what else can we do? And he kind of looked at me incredulously like, well, I have this idea. And this idea is to bring black coaches to coach with your coaches and create a documentary. And I said, okay, I'll get back to you. And a day later, I got back to him. I said, when do you start? Mm -hmm. And he couldn't believe it. So what happened, right? We brought two coaches, one from Toronto, one from DC, to coach with our coaches. And you know what happened? Our coaches said, those are really good coaches, <laughs> right? And they did a documentary on it, NHL Bound on ESPN Plus. You can take a look at it. And then you know what happened? Our coaches asked us if we would hire one of them. And then Team USA asked if we could hire another one of them. It's about putting people in the room, right? Exactly. I often say talent knows no race, no, no ethnicity, no gender, no sexual orientation. Race, I mean, talent needs opportunity. And when you put people in the room, this strange thing happens. They succeed and people get to know them. And to me, that's an example of what can be modeled. Put people in the room, give them the opportunity to succeed, and guess what? You now create these networks that are self-fulfilling. That's the way corporate America, that's the way finance, investment communities, mm -hmm. that's what they've been trying to do for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Sports needs to not only help model that, mm -hmm. but to, to push that along. When yep. you engage people, when you give them that opportunity, when you put them in the room, they will succeed and you will change the face. Now I want to take it down. <laughs> Something that we need to talk about, and it's happening across the country, because physical education has been taken out of the school systems. The problem is there's so much talent out there, and what is starting to happen is this economic disparity of the haves and the have-nots. So you see all of these um, sports clubs starting up. And you're starting to see, you know, soccer moms and suburban people, they, they've got these very expensive clubs that have started up. And I think we need to start looking at how do we get to the underserved communities and build clubs there. Mm -hmm. It's important, and I think it would take crime off the street, but these kids are getting left behind. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming an economic, it's, be, it's all about the economy. Mm -hmm. You know, those that can pay and those that can't. So they're losing the opportunities. Yeah. And I want to make sure that we start giving them the opportunities so that they can compete on an equal level. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the challenge is greatest in hockey. I and mean, we know. Yes. My program collects the data on this. The average family spends $2,500 a year on hockey. Mm -hmm. That's like three times what of any other sport out there. And which explains the lack of diversity in the NHL on the ice itself. Now you have your 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 um, your uh, hockey initiative, make it, right. and you do as well. Yep. Have you developed any ideas around how to crack this very challenging nut? And I'll share one uh, one learning from Detroit in a minute. But I'm curious to know what. You well, so the first thing I I talked about was the the continuum of hockey, right? So you have to start actually with something very simple, which is street hockey. It's blacktop, it's a, it's a stick, it's a puck. And guess what, My, literally in the middle of COVID, we went to a community center that the Coyotes had never been to. It was like 110% Latino and African American, right? <laughs> right? It was, it over indexed. And we put sticks in the hands of these young kids. I was afraid that they would start you know, hitting each other with it, but they loved it. Mm -hmm. They loved it. And so to me, I often talk about, we're not here to make hockey fans. We're here to make coyote fans, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And coyote fans show up. Mm -hmm. You know, we're there. And then you go from there, you go to roller hockey. Mm -hmm. Then you go to ice hockey. Ice hockey is very expensive, namely because of ice rinks, where you, especially in the desert, 
you can't just go backyard <laughs> and put the water out and the next thing you know you have you have a there's no, you know, pond, there's no pond hockey yeah there's no the pond hockey <laughs> out there but you know what street hockey is the great equalizer in my opinion right it's very similar to basketball you can literally and in fact we invested in inflatable rinks just so that you have the bumpers on the end just because i could show up to places we had never been and said, you can be part of our organization, of our sport. But you're right, it's expensive as you continue and this professionalization of youth hockey that you're seeing, that has to be addressed by the teams, by the leagues, right. by communities. We have to address that because you are getting to this barbell situation in baseball, in basketball, in hockey. Um, and so for us, it's, it's that, it's being present, it's, it's starting at the lowest level, and it's starting with every, every part of the community, right? right? Impact, inclusion, and innovation are our three pillars. And on the inclusion side, it's literally including every part of the community. We started the first English-Spanish learn to play program, Los Jalitos, <laughs> right? And why? Because we wanted families to believe that they could be part of our sport. Mm -hmm. And that's how you really address it. It's gonna take time, but that's how you address it. Yeah, so we bring the, the, these kids in and they come in onto our ice rink mm -hmm. in Boston, in Arlington. And it's just amazing, all the offices are above and to watch them down there on the ice, it, it, it'll bring you to tears mm -hmm. because we're giving them an opportunity mm -hmm. of a lifetime. On the basketball side over in Southeast, we invite the play, I mean, the young kids in, and they watch our coach coaching our teams. Mm -hmm. And the Wizards come out, and they get all excited again, and Mystics and the Wizards will play together. So it's, it's, they're learning some valuable lessons out there, and that's how we have to get into the community. Yeah. Yeah. Sports is the greatest equalizer. Mm -hmm. You build arenas, everybody comes in there, they're friends. Mm -hmm. They have a common bond. Mm -hmm. right you can't break and the, I mean you saw it here as you all won the Stanley Cup I mean I experienced it in Washington DC with the caps when they won it yeah. I mean people that weren't really talking to each other are now talking to each other because mm -hmm. they have something in common mm -hmm. and sports is so valuable and so important mm -hmm. and I'm, one other thing I'm gonna throw out there because I was a former teacher we have got to get physical education back into the school system We've got to, it's affecting physical fitness. Um, they've got to learn how to play as a team. They learn valuable lessons either on the court or in playing with hockey, how to communicate with one another in a different way and learning how to work together right. mm -hmm. and to listen and focus. Mm -hmm. And we've taken that away and look at what's happening. Mm -hmm. Now, Ray, I want to ask you about the engaging uh, Latino populations. Again, we collect the data on this. We know that Latino kids, boys in particular, play a lot of soccer. Yes. There are a couple other sports. There's <laughs> not a great diversity of sports that Latino kids are playing. No. And we're talking about a significant chunk of our population. Mm -hmm. How important do you think it is to exposing kids to you know, Latino kids to sports to, to, to simply push your business forward, right? Because you've got an array of properties that go well beyond soccer, right? And so, one of the things we're doing that's different from our major competitors who focus totally on soccer is we are bringing NFL football in. We're doing the Preakness and the Derby, and we're going to do the Tour de France and the French Open. We're going to put those on Telemundo. We need. I think a lot of the way I grew up, you know the way your fandom starts is it's really role modeling. Mm -hmm. You're looking for a hero, you're looking for someone. I mean, we talked about esports the other day and how mm -hmm. now kids are just staying home watching other people play sports instead of, because of phys ed not being in the schools, right. instead of being out playing, they're home on their couch playing, which is just a disaster. <laughs> but what you need to do is put that evolution into play by bringing them, again, access, bringing them content they may never have seen before. So that's kind of the mission I'm on, which is to take a lot of NBC Sports content that has Spanish language rights and let's show it mm -hmm. and see what happens. We Winter Olympics, we talked about that. Everybody, oh, Hispanic has no interest in Winter Olympics. So I had research done and guess what? Out of a couple of hundred people that we did a quick online survey, 5% said I'm not interested and 95% picked a sport. They love speed and danger. 
So if it's luge, if it's men's down, mm -hmm. if it's, they, they do, they love speed skating. Fine, let's do it. But you gotta try to do it, you know, get them in the room, right? Can you make a, can I make a suggestion? Can you go to um, the NBA, WNBA, and see, even though we're on ESPN, <laughs> Can you all kind of merge a little bit so we can get more media coverage? The women just don't get the media coverage. No. And it's true. just killing me. Yep. It is killing me. We need Forever. to do, or, I mean, there's something that's got to be done. Yep, I agree. Well, we need to they're be. They're on my list. NBA's on my list. Okay. Right? We, did you say NBA or WNBA? Well, oh. the NBA, which owns the uh, I WNBA. Know, I, know. I, have to get the right from, <laughs> I have to get the rights from Adam Silver. There okay? you go. So. Boy, I, I, there's got to be some way where we can get more exposure, and we need it all year round. We just well, don't want it in the summer. That could be something that Mid-Atlantic can do, the, the you know, NBC Sports Washington. We can talk oh. down there about how that works. Tom, we'll I, I, you, know, <laughs> you don't look like a believer, but that's okay. I will say this, and I know I said it earlier, but I will emphasize this. Latinos, African-American, females, they want to be welcomed. Right. They want to feel as if you want them there. Yeah. I've invited so many diverse people to hockey games, to their first hockey game ever, and they're blown away. They're like, where have, where have I been? You know what? They didn't feel welcomed. Mm -hmm. They didn't feel like it, right? Like uh, there was a young African American woman who said something for an NHL spot. She says, "I love hockey. I don't know if hockey loves me." Mm. Huh. And that's what we need to address, right? Really uh, uh, right? And, and we need to address it. And uh, speaking of role modeling, at the risk of getting in trouble with Commissioner Batman, this year's Hart Trophy winner, Austin Gutierrez Matthews. Okay the first Latino to win the MVP in the NHL. So it's not as if it doesn't happen. We need to create more avenues. We need to make people feel like we love them yeah. and we welcome them. And we need to hire in the C-suites of hockey. Oh, well, that's absolutely. There very, is that. It's mm -hmm. non non-existent. And that, that, that applies to youth teams as well. I mean, one of the challenges, even in sports like soccer, is there'll be these suburban teams like you know Sheila's talking about where parents are paying two three thousand dollars a year uh, almost all white usually and then they'll cherry pick a kid or two from an urban environment who'll come out and play right might be Latino or otherwise and it often isn't sustainable why because it doesn't feel welcoming they're not among other people so I mean mm -hmm. personally we believe that the solution is not bring kids out to the suburbs, but let's create more teams in the urban so. areas where peers can play with peers. The barrier to entry in terms of transportation and cost and coaches who look like you, that's where you're gonna find the real, the real go growth. And I, I think you, that's even true in like hockey. We went into you know, East Harlem, did a survey there. 51% you know, Latino community. Kids wanted hockey. Absolutely. And so the NHL and Madison Square Garden looked at our survey and said, okay, well, we're going to put it in the schools. We're going to the PE teachers. We're going to do floor hockey. Next thing you know, many more kids are exposed to the game. So there are solutions out there. Um, let, let me, uh, before we go to some Q&A here, let me ask you about the role of athletes. Okay, we talk about what teams can do and are doing, but what about athletes? They have wealth. They have massive social media followings. Um, Philanthropically, I don't know. Sheila, what's I the... I think we need to bring Stefan Curry in here, and we need to talk to him because I think he's developing the blueprint of how to really get all the athletes together. I wish they would all culminate together to put together a plan where they can really reach into the bowels of the urban market and really get so many kids off the streets and back in the sports. And that's... What, I mean, there's so many athletes, they start up their charitable organizations, they fizzle out after two to three years. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it could be a tax write-off, we don't know why, or you know, they're just busy playing. Mm -hmm. But I think if we here at the Institute could get Stefan in here and have him put together a blueprint and you can help him do it, <laughs> and to We're get good. out there and get LeBron James and all these other players together and say, look, let's, let's make it a mission. Yeah to get out there to read it, really reach out into communities that really need help. Yeah. 
Typically, those yep. foundations and 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 you know charitable givings are literally either taxed or know what they suggested are, yeah. by the wrong people for the wrong reason. Yeah. And that's where if you put all the athletes together, I mean, I can't imagine that a bunch of guys who did and gals, but mostly guys because the gals aren't doing as well. A bunch of guys who did really well financially. Yeah got in a room and said, you know, why don't we just try to help sports, the things that made us where we are. But they're given, again, it's misdirected. It's it is. just misdirected. Totally. Yeah. yeah. What uh, Sheila's was referring to is Stephen Curry has, Stephen and Aisha Curry have the Eat, Learn, Play Foundation based in Oakland. Yep. They're investing in Oakland. Right. They've actually, they're working with our program to landscape the state of play there. We're going to produce a report later next month. Um, but yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think every athlete should do that kind of thing for the for the right. geography that matters to them. But if yeah. they can put it, they need to work together to create this umbrella so mm -hmm. that they're all doing the same thing and helping so they're on the same page. Yeah. The, on, the only thing I'll add is, you know, I'll talk about hockey players. There is a desire to do for others, for the most part. There's just a lack of understanding how best to do it. And I think it does take an outside entity Maybe like the Aspen Institute to help them get there. Yep, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's go to uh, questions here. Hi. First of all, I want to say thank you. I my head is spinning with joy at what you're saying. I happen to work for Harris Blitzer Sports Entertainment. Oh. So and just for women's sports, Sheila. Okay. Uh, there you go. Ju and Mr. Blitzer just invested in that. Yeah. So there's your coverage. Um, uh, hmm. Physical education, yes, we take the newer boys chorus school and they come skating, which people didn't know. So please, everybody listen. It's not just the wealthy athletes and the owners. They care. The NHL leads the way. Susan Cohey has women in there all the time in the offices and everything. So please go tell everybody. My question to you is there are lots of smaller foundations that are working in these communities that we don't know of. So how do you decide to create your own new program or take your value and your knowledge and everything else and support some of those smaller ones that might thrive even more with all of our help. I have to say through Monumental Sports, we have been able to tap on all these smaller organizations and we have put them together because we're now the umbrella to help them financially. Mm -hmm. So we are very, very involved from building playgrounds to bring them into our arena, we even do a camp day where we bring all of the kids in during the summertime. We play in the Caps Arena. It is packed. It is the most exciting time. I love going to camp day because those kids are roaring and dancing. And it's just exciting. But it's important that we as owners identify all these little pillars that are in the community and say, look, we're going to support you. It's just like when we're doing the strategic plan and I was doing with Jason Wright, to get all these corporations together and say, look, let's work together, because we can solve the problems by putting all the money together, and we put the blueprint together so that we're out there really touching lives. Yeah. What, we, yeah. what we've done is we've looked at the corporate world, philanthropic world, and the academic world, and to Sheila's point, we just bring them together, right? We're the convener, and we create depth and breath in terms of our giving, but also in terms of our convening in those three sort of circuits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Anyone? Um, hi, can you hear me? Uh, hi, my name is Ernest Esparza. I'm a KIPP Aspen Fellow. And I guess with the conversation of guidance and sort of mentorship, a lot of us are building out our careers and we're trying to find like our personal counsel that we can pick ideas and try to be guided in the right path. Um, so my question is, how did you all pick your guidance, your personal like in-house counsel throughout your career? Um, and how did you build that trust with those individuals? Okay. Um, so for me, it was, I mean, I again, Bronx, New York, uh, nothing going on there. Um, but <laughs> I, I wound up finding people who I could learn from. I always wanted to work for somebody smarter than me. And once I felt like I was kind of catching up, I kind of got a little cranky and you know, had to move. But I think it's you've got to be your own best critic and your own best ambassador. Does, is this person helping me? Because they're your boss or they're somebody who's been around longer doesn't mean they're helping you. 
and, and you kind of have to know yourself first. What do you want to do? Which, by the way, the, it's a journey. Um, and you just have to be open. But I always felt it was important to kind of really have a point of view on the person that I'm trying to look at as a mentor. Because sometimes people come to you and you just need one, so you take it. But is it the right person? You have to be a little bit an editor of your own destiny, really. I will just add very quickly, embrace the door openers in your life. They come in all shapes and sizes and all times in your life. But they'll open doors for you, and you may end up somewhere you never thought you'd be. That's a good one. But it's exactly where you should be, right. like a Latino running a hockey team in the desert. <laughs> or a guy right. from the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> or a guy from the Bronx running Telemundo Sports. Exactly. <laughs> Who'd have guessed? That's, that's <laughs> yeah, my advice is you become the CEO of your own life. Okay. Yeah. There you go. That's like really that. important, and you will have opportunities that'll come along. Trust your instincts. Those doors are open. Sometimes you'll go through those doors and it doesn't work. But you know, any, and I, hate, I don't like to use the word failure, but that's good for you. Mm -hmm. People have got to learn how to navigate adversity. Mm -hmm. You have to try and cherry pick everything. The other thing you need to do is to set boundaries. I have learned the hard way. I have let people into my life who come in with their own agenda. I call them energetic vampires. <laughs> and, and they will. <laughs> take whatever knowledge they can from you and they will run with it. So be very, very careful. But you've got to know who you are. You have to know which, what is your passion. And you stick with that. Okay. Well, that's terrific. I'm getting the wrap it up uh, sign here. <laughs> so that was terrific advice. Thank you, Sheila, Javier, Ray, for an incredible panel.